You just need to hang on for a few more days. I know. I really feel like giving <laughs> Hey, good morning, Alamo Community Church. Welcome to ACC. Come on in and find a seat. We are so grateful that you are here. And for those of you who are watching online with us this morning, thank you so much for tuning in. Reality is you could be about a thousand other places this morning, and yet you are here. So we are so incredibly grateful for you gathering with us. If you're a first time guest this morning, we specifically want to say thank you to you. And in fact, we would love to meet you right outside in the hallway is an area called Connection Point. And that's a place where we would love to direct you so we could get to know you and we have a gift for you. We say our mission at ACC is to connect and reconnect people to God. And that happens in a myriad of different ways through this church. But one of the, mo one of the more specific ways that happened was this past weekend as our women's ministry gathered for what's called the If Gathering. And so, yeah, amen. We had over 100 women right here in our own building gathered here underneath teaching and connecting and growing and really just thriving as a ministry. It was an awesome opportunity, and I have heard nothing but incredible things. The leadership team in our women's ministry is incredible. And specifically, I want to say thank you to Lori Flowers and all that she did for that team. Yes, they are so awesome. Now, I also may be a little bit biased, but I also want to shout out the fellas, okay? Because at the women's gathering, there was three guys who were also serving a ton. Yes, these guys were the ones making it happen. Two of these guys are single, so I also felt it was strategic <laughs> in a lot of ways that they, they were here. So I just want to shout them out for that, just wisdom on both sides of that. So we're super grateful. We're super excited. Today is going to be an incredible day in the Word and in worship. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you would just stand with me, I'm going to pray for us, and then Caleb and the team are going to lead us into a time of worship. So Lord Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you for a chance to gather this morning, God. Thank you for this incredible weekend and all that you did in our women's ministry, all that you did uh, around the world through the If Gathering. God, we just, we say thank you for that, God. Lord, but today is a new day and your mercies are new every morning. And Jesus, we need them. We need new mercy today, God. We need a fresh word and a fresh wind. And so Jesus, we ask you, we know you are already here with us, God, but we're just asking you to meet with us in a unique way. God, for the word that you have to, to stir us, Lord, to lead us and to guide us, I pray for every individual in here that we would be prepared to receive this right now. That as we step into worship, we're stepping into an opportunity to meet with you. This is no casual gathering. This is an incredible divine appointment. And God, you have something unique to do today. And so today we press in. We press into what you're doing right now in this moment, God. Something is happening in this place. And we pray that you would gather people from all over this community. For those who are watching online, God, that you have a specific purpose for today. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.
Christ 
shows up right in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your sin, of your struggle, and how nothing stays the same after that. This is why we pray on Sundays that the Spirit would prepare our hearts, because we don't know how to do that. We have no frame of reference for what it means to encounter the mercy of Jesus, the love of Jesus, but it's here for us right now. And so our prayer today is that we would all come open, ready to receive, ready to have everything blown open by the power of Jesus. Let's sing this together when you come. When you come, like an avalanche of grace, when you come, there is freedom in this place. When
the scripture that was um, at the top of your Lent guide this week. It's in uh, Hebrews 12. It's Hebrews 12, 18 through 25. And I'm going to get on my knees to read this. And so whatever posture you need to take right now, I know we're not really get on your knees church all the time, but if you need to get on your knees in these aisles, then get on your knees. If you need to open your hands, whatever posture you need to take in order to hear the word of God and know that he is here in this place, I want you to do that unashamed because he wants to speak to you today. to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire to darkness and gloom and storm, to a trumpet blaster, to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in the heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. God, we don't want to refuse your word today. We don't want to refuse what you have for us. We pray that we would know that when you come, you are faithful and that we can trust in that, God. And I pray for those who don't feel like they can sing it. I pray that they would hear the words of those around them, that we would sing for our neighbors, that we would sing for the people sitting next to us, that we would sing for the people in the back, and that we would sing for the people in front, God, because you have called us a body and that when we cannot speak, God, that somebody else can sing for us. God, we pray that we would hear your word, that we wouldn't leave this place not having met you here today, not having been in your presence and known what your face looks like, what your voice sounds like. God, I pray that we would be desperate to know you, more desperate than comfort, more desperate than, than whatever relationship that we're focused on, more desperate than whatever job we have or haven't got. Lord, I pray that you would put it all at the wayside and we would be desperate to hear your voice and we would know that in that, God, in that, you will never not be faithful. We love you so much, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing this together, you will always come. You will always come like the rising sun, like the rising sun.
sun like the rising sun you will always come you will always come breaking through the night lighting up the sky
know you are right here in this room. That you were here before we showed up. You're with us when we leave here. But we wait for you. Some of us in here wait for you, God, and as we lift our hands, we're giving you what we can't control. People, circumstance, struggles, heartbreak, we're giving these things to you. Sickness, God, marriages, families, depression, anxiety, we are giving these things to you. We were never meant to carry these things. We can't get past them. We can't carry them. We can't make them work on our own. Only you can. And you tell us that you are faithful to do it. So God, we come to you. We lift these things we can't control and we say, do what only you can. Bring order where there's chaos, God. Restore relationships where they are broken, God. Bring healing where we are sick. Perform miracles. Do what you do, what only you can do. We trust what your word says, what you tell us, that you are faithful in every season, that you carry your people and you love us to the end. And so here, God, at the end of ourselves, may we find the beginning of you. May you lead us into deeper trust, into greater love. Would we experience today the power of mercy, God, and the fire of hope. Would you send your spirit across this room to open hearts today, to hear you speak like you're right next to us, God. You are alive. You are moving. You are miraculous. You are magnificent. You are all these things here and now. So we trust you, God. It's in the name of Jesus, our King, that we say together, amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue this morning. Hey, ACC, as we continue in our time of worship, I just want to stop and thank you for being with us here this morning. If you are a student, and if you are a parent of said student, I have got some amazing news for you. We are officially going to summer camp this year. We're going to be partnering with Student Life Camp for two amazing and safe opportunities for our middle schoolers and for our high schoolers to have a real encounter with the Lord Jesus through summer camps. So let's lead off with middle school. Here's what we're going to do. From July 5th to the 9th, we're going to load up and we're going to head to Mount Lebanon Camp, which is based in Cedar Hill, Texas. It costs $329 and I'm thrilled for it. Secondly, our high schoolers, we're going to be loading up and head to, wait for it, Glorieta, New Mexico, which is based in the southern foothills of the Rockies. And the dates for that are June 22nd to June the 26th. And the cost for that is $349. Now, because registration is live right now, I want to make life easy for you to register. So here's all I need you to do today. You can go on to our ACC app and find the student page, and what you'll see there is a registration link for high school camp and for middle school camp. And all I need you to do today is register and put down a $25 deposit. Super easy. What we'll do then is we'll be following up with you for further payments, and we'll be keeping in touch on what you'll need to know as we lead up to camp. But let me just say again, I could not be more excited for what God is going to do as this is really just a culmination of what he's been doing in our lives through the last year. While I'm talking about our ACC app, we know that whenever you give to ACC, what you're really doing is you're giving through ACC. And so what you can do today, if you're able to give or make a gift, is you can either A, you can hop onto our ACC app and give that way, or after church lets out, you can head out the back doors behind you and you'll find some black boxes and you can make your gift that way. As you know, Easter Sunday is on April the 4th this year. And one of the things that we thought would be so beautiful as we celebrate our Lord Jesus' resurrection would be to celebrate the new birth that happens in the heart of a believer 
through baptism. And so if you are interested in being baptized and making the public declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ, here's what we're doing. We're offering two baptism courses that begin actually tomorrow night right here at the church, March 8th at 6.30. And then the follow-up course will be March 15th, again, on Monday night at 6.30. And this will be an incredible way for you to learn more about what baptism is and how beneficial it is to understand it in such an impactful way moving forward in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As Pastor Donnie McCann comes up to give us an incredible word out of the book of Matthew, I would invite you to turn there. And I would also like to give you a friendly reminder that next Sunday, March 14th, we're going to lose an hour of sleep. It's going to be Time Change Sunday. So get some rest and be ready to worship with us next week. But as of right now, let's prepare our hearts and let's get ready for an incredible word. have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 8. Matthew in the New Testament, first book. Matthew chapter 8, while you're finding your place, let me tell you what's happening thus far in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus has just finished preaching his very first sermon. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. It is the first set of teachings that we have ever recorded by Jesus. It is the longest sermon that he ever gave almost as long as a Proudfoot sermon, but not quite. And so in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches on all kinds of different subjects that we talk about all the time. Things like uh, prayer and justice and care for the needy, divorce, fasting, um, judging other people. He talks about anxiety and worry. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he says some things that really kind of don't make sense. In fact, they're a little bit counterintuitive. And, and he talks about some things that just, you know, it's hard to wrap your mind around. Things like, blessed are the poor. And we'd say, that, that doesn't really make sense. We would say, blessed are the, the rich. If you go to someone's house and, and they have this incredible house or they have this incredible car and you say, wow, this house is amazing, nobody says, well, I'm rich. No, what they say is, well, We've been blessed. And so we would say, blessed are the rich. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Poor equals blessed. Sorrow equals comfort. Persecution leads to joy. And so what he said here was very counterintuitive. And, and, and when he had finished speaking, the crowds that had gathered to hear him that day, they, they were amazed at his teaching. Matthew says they were amazed because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The crowds were amazed at what they had just heard. Jesus had completely turned everything upside down. It was unlike anything that they had ever heard before. But his words were challenging. They were difficult. They were hard to to comprehend, to wrap your minds around. But when he finished... They were amazed. Now, the original language in Matthew chapter 7, this word amazed, is the Greek word ekplesso. It means to be overwhelmed, to be astounded. The crowd had just listened to Jesus teach, and and it was a lot to take in. They They were overwhelmed by what they heard. They were amazed. Not just because of what he said, but because of the authority in which he said it. And then we come to verse 1 of Matthew chapter 8, where Matthew says, Jesus came down from the mountainside, and large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He said, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Go, your, show yourself to the priest, offer the gift, offer the gift Moses commandment, commanded, excuse me, as a testimony to them. And then verse 5 says, When Jesus had come to Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Now let me just stop here at this point in the story. Because what happens here is not normal. 
What happened here should not have happened. A centurion was a non-commissioned officer in the Roman army in charge of 100 men. It was a, a career position, and they were good at what they did. Centurions were known for leading their men into battle. They didn't form a command position at the back and just send their men into battle. They fought side by side, and so there was this, this high level of respect. They were courageous. They were willing to lay down their lives. In peacetime, centurions were responsible for, for discipline and for maintaining peace and for, for structure and training and, and keeping up the morale of Roman soldiers. Centurions were good men. In fact, every time we read about a centurion in the New Testament, it's always in a positive light. It was a centurion who stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying and looked at his face and said, surely this man is the Son of God. It was a centurion named Cornelius who was the first Gentile to become a Christ follower. You flip a, more, a few more pages and you come to the biography of the Apostle Paul. And it was, it was a centurion who, who was always getting him out of one dilemma after another. They were good men. But they were the enemy. They were Gentiles. They were, they were pagans. And no practicing religious Jew, especially not a rabbi, would ever be willing to stop and help a Roman. But Jesus did. Look at verse 6. The centurion said, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And so Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just Say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go, and he goes, and this one to come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. You see, this Roman soldier had recognized in Jesus the same things that the crowd had recognized, that he was a man who speaks and is a man of great authority. His words were powerful. They were unlike anything anyone had ever heard. And because of his own station in life, he knew that it was only those under authority who had the right to exercise authority. And so he comes to Jesus and he asks for help. And verse 10 says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. There's that word again. But you should know, this is not the same amazed that we read earlier. This was not being overwhelmed or astounded. It's not ekplesso. The word that Matthew uses here is the Greek word thaumatso, which means to be filled with astonishment. Literally, it means to have your breath taken away. In our vernacular, it would be, wow. This is the word. Jesus was amazed. Matthew said that when Jesus heard what this centurion said, it caused him to stop and say, wow, he was amazed. And then he said to those following him in verse 10, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great, and here's the word we're going to spend our time talking about this morning, faith. If you've been around church very long, or Christians very long, you recognize this word, faith. It's a word that we used often. It's kind of in the Christian top three. Love, hope, faith. But there's this tendency, I think, when it comes to teaching about faith, when it comes to people like me, pastors and preachers, to treat faith as a theoretical, as a, a, a doctrinal issue that needs to be explained. But I think un, and to understand faith best, we don't just read about it. We don't just talk about it. We don't just learn about it. We live it. We live it out. If we want to understand faith, we have to see that it's more than just a, a theoretical belief. It needs to be a tangible expression. Because faith really isn't faith until it's expressed. You see this consistently throughout Scripture. When we read the Bible, we see this. We, we, when we learn about faith, we don't learn about it by definition, but we learn about it through expression, through stories. If you want to understand faith then you have to understand the stories that are attached to faith. 
In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it gives us a very simple and yet profound definition of what faith is. The writer says this, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance in what we do not see. Well, what does that mean? I mean, it's very poetic language, but, but what, does it, what does it mean? Well, fortunately for us, the writer doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just give us a definition, but he attaches stories of faith to it as well. For example, in verse 4, he says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And by faith, he was commended as righteous. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith, Isaac, and by faith, Jacob, and and by faith, Joseph, and Daniel, and Moses, and Rahab, and on and on the story goes. Stories of, of men and women stepping out in confident faith in the authority of God. Faith is a confidence in what we hope for. But I think for most of us, when we think of faith, when we think of this confidence, we think of it more as a a hopeful optimism, having a positive perspective, kind of like when the underdog team goes out onto the field or all to the the ball court. They go into the game knowing that they're probably going to lose, but they have this confidence, this hope that anything could happen on any given day, this this hopeful optimism. Hopefully it will happen, but, but, but we don't know for sure. And I think that's oftentimes how we view faith, how we view our confidence in God. But the word confidence here is is not translated as a hopeful optimism. The word confidence here is really an absolute certainty. An absolute certainty. Actually, it's stronger than that. It's speaking about something that has yet to happen as if it's already happened. That's what we're talking about here. When we have this biblical confidence, it's speaking of the future in the past tense. That's how confident you are. And the centurion came to Jesus and he said, Lord, you don't even have to go to my house. Just say the word and it will happen. In Joshua chapter 6, there's a story that I love. Perhaps you've heard of it before. It's the story of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. In Joshua 6, we read that Moses has died and he passed on the mantle of leadership to to Joshua. And now they are gathering and ready to go into the promised land. But there's a problem. Jericho cannot be conquered. It seems impossible. Jericho, Jericho was known for having these huge protective walls. There was an outer wall that was 12 feet thick. And inside that, there was another wall that was six feet thick. And both of these walls were protected day and night by guards. And so they get there, and it seems like it's an impossibility. But we read in verse 2 of Joshua chapter 6. This is what it says. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. See, I have delivered. Now, I think Joshua may be like some of us sometimes. And he begin, especially when it comes to trusting God, and he says, you know, God, I don't want to get caught up in the details here, but you haven't delivered anything yet. We're still on this side of the wall. And I get it, God. Sometimes we all get our verb tenses mixed up, and, and you said, see, I have, but I think what you meant to say is, see, I'm going to. See, I one day will, but, but that's not what he said. God said, see, I have. It's done It is finished. Biblical faith is confidence in the authority of God. It is speaking of something that has yet to happen as if it's already happened. He's God. He can do that. I think for many of us, though, we don't don't look at faith like that. At least not me. I, I view faith more like setting my alarm clock at night. On most nights, I set it. I don't even think about it. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to go off. I have, hey, confidence. We just set it and we hope for the best. But if there's something that's going to happen that is really important, if I have a flight to catch 
or a meeting to be at, and I, something that I don't want to be late. What do we do? We, we set our alarm clock, and then we set a backup to the alarm clock, right? And if it's really important, we have a backup to the backup. We're confident that it will go off. We're pretty sure that it's going to happen. But just in case, we need a backup plan. The word confidence in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is confident, confidence. It means there's no backup plan. This guy came to Jesus for help with no other options. No backup plan. The very fact that a Roman official would, would come to a Jewish rabbi, would, would humble himself and even humiliate himself, asking for help, tells us that there was no plan B. Either Jesus was going to heal his servant or he was going to die. And that was it. But his faith, his belief, his plan was in the authority of Jesus Christ, and he was confident that Jesus could be trusted no matter what. And that faith amazed Jesus. Look at verse 13 of our text, Matthew chapter 8. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you believed, past tense, that it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Determined, confident faith is more than a hopeful optimism. It is an absolute certainty. And all of God's people said, yeah, but. Said, I get what you're saying. It's a good story. But you don't know my life. I get it. I'm tracking with you. I, I want to buy into what you're saying. But my life is not like that. I don't get to the happily ever after ending in my story. We read earlier from Hebrews chapter 11. And we went through this long list of names. Some of the heroes of the faith. Ordinary people of the Bible that, that we see God come through for in, in extraordinary ways. But if you keep reading in Hebrews 11, you'll eventually come to a different group of people different heroes of the faith. You have the first group, Abraham and, and, and Moses and David and Daniel and all of those people that made it to flannel graph fame. Right? We would label them as group one. Those group one is, are those people who have accomplished great things by God's power through, through their faith. That's group one. But if you keep reading, you come to a second group. Group two. And group two is labeled something much different. Verse 35 of Hebrews 11 says, There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and persecuted and mistreated, and the world was not worthy of them. Hebrews 11 begins with this incredible examples of, uh, of people who accomplished the impossible through their faith. But then we get to this group uh, who endured the unimaginable in their faith, and it's separated by the words, there were others. Now, here's what I know. No one signs up in life to be part of the others. We all want our faith to be powerful, but we want to be part of group one. We want to shut the mouths of lions. We don't want to be devoured by them. We want to slay the giants. We don't want to be crushed by him. Sign me up for group one. I want to be part of, uh, of group one. But there were others. And oftentimes, we find ourselves in group two. And truthfully, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there are going to be times in your life when you find yourself in both. There will be, there will be times when, when God seems to be accomplishing things in you that you never could have imagined. 
But there will be other times when you feel like you're enduring what you never thought you could get through. There were others. In July of 2010, I was speaking at a youth camp in Panama City, Florida. And on the last night of camp, we had a, a baptism service and a communion service out on the beach. It was, it was quite incredible. And as I was teaching that night, my phone began to vibrate in my pocket. And, and of course, I, I, I ignored it. But later that night, as I was driving home, I, I pulled it out and I listened to the voicemail, to the message that was on my phone. It was from a friend of mine named Jack. I had known Jack most of his life since he was a little boy and known his family. And from the time that Jack was little, people were, they were drawn to him. There was something about this kid. He just had this magnetic personality. He had this infectious smile and this outlook on life that was unmatched. Jack was not a glass half full kind of guy. Jack was a, a glass full to the brim and overflowing kind of guy. I was his middle school soccer coach. And it just so happened that, that I moved up to coaching high school soccer his freshman year in high school. And so I coached him from sixth grade to 12th grade, which was, was great for me, not so much for him. I was a mediocre coach at best, but he was an incredible, incredible athlete. Jack was a natural leader in the field and on the class, in the classroom. 9-11 happened his senior year, and like so many young men and women following that tragic day, after high school, he joined the military. He became a Marine. And although his uniform had changed, Jack was still this full-to-the-brim kind of guy that I knew and loved. He served multiple tours in Iraq and, and Af Afghanistan, and, and even under the most difficult of circumstances, he made a difference and impacted those people that he was around. He came back from Iraq, went to college, he met the love of his life, and he got married. And as a 26-year-old man, his whole life was in front of him. Jack called me that night when I was in Panama City to let me know that he was playing a pickup game of basketball when he had this sharp so a pain in his side. And he was convinced that it was something to do with his appendix, and so he goes to the doctor but it wasn't his appendix. It was cancer. A rare, aggressive, incurable cancer known as desmoplastic small round cell tumor. And instantly his life changed. But like with all things in life, Jack, he set out to be, beat cancer with his Usual determination and optimism. Smile on his face. And the treatments were rough. Some of them experimental. And chemo took a huge toll on his body. And this athletic, strong Marine that I, that I knew and loved, he was reduced to skin and bones. But his spirit never changed. He was the same funny, encouraging people person that, that he had always been. He did a lot of his treatments at MD Anderson, and, and he would be there by himself. And so as often as I could, I would, I would drive over just to spend some time with him. I remember driving the first time I went from his hotel to his appointment, uh, appointment taking him there. And I'd never been to MD Anderson before. And it was just a, a few miles from the hotel, but it was, I was kind of lost and confusing. And so Jack was my navigator. He told me where to go, and so he would say, Coach, up here you're going to take this first left, and then you're going to take the second right. And we would get to the parking garage, and, and I would pull into, I was getting ready to pull into a space, and he'd say, Hey, you don't want to park here. Go to the next floor, because there we can catch the sky bridge to go to my appointment. And all throughout this massive medical complex, Jack gave perfect directions on where to go, and it, and it, it dawned on me that he knew this place all too well. And I was overwhelmed with a sense of, of sadness and yet comfort at the same time. Because just like always, Jack knew where he was going and what he was doing. 
Shannon and I were in Tennessee for Thanksgiving, and we went to see Jack. He, he looked worse than I'd, I'd ever seen him. The cancer had made him almost unrecognizable, and he knew that the end was near. And so as we stayed with him, we just spent the afternoon talking, talking about soccer and high school and how bad the University of Tennessee football team was and how awesome Duke basketball was. He told me inappropriate jokes from the Marines and different stories, and we laughed. And life was just like it had always been. And before we left that day, uh, I said, Jack, can I ask you a question? And he said, anything, coach. I said, how have you done this? How have you been able to do this? How have you been able to, to be so happy and, and maintain such joy in the midst of overwhelming pain? And with a big smile on his face, he said, Coach, I've had a good life. I've got to travel the world. I have great friends, beautiful wife, a loving family, a dog that, that adores me. What else is there? And then he said this. My faith is in God. And when he's done with me here, I'm okay with that. And as much as I would have liked my friend Jack to be in group one, he found himself in group two. There were others. Sometimes I think of faith as God doing what I want him to do. That if I, if I have faith, because I think, God, this is going to be best, and so this is what you should do. Now, I don't say it like that. That's what I mean. You see, I wanted God to heal my friend. I, I wanted to be able to tell the story of Jack and his incredible faith and the faith of his friends and the faith of his family. I would have given anything for Jack to have been on this stage today to tell you his testimony about his story of faith. I wanted God to do something that in my mind I thought would make the most sense. But that's not what biblical faith is. Sometimes faith heals. and Sometimes it gives you the strength to make it through the day till you, till you get to that place of perfect healing. Our faith is not in the circumstances of this life. Our faith is in the character and the authority of God. Don't interpret life going well as a reason to have more faith. And don't interpret life going poorly as a reason to lose faith. Our faith is not, what is, it's not in what is happening to us. Our faith is in the one who holds us in his hand. Sometimes faith looks like a wife on her knees in a hospital waiting room, praying and begging and pleading with God for her husband. And the doctors come out and they say, I don't know what happened. It's not there. There was a tumor, but it, it's not there. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. That's what faith looks like. But sometimes faith is a wife sitting in a cemetery and watching her husband being lowered into the ground. That's faith too. Sometimes faith is a high school student who, who decides to start a Bible study on campus and it just takes off. And incredible things are accomplished and there's this revival that, that, that breaks out in the school. Sometimes that's what faith looks like. But sometimes faith is a high school student who walks into school with a Bible and, and convictions and standards and is mocked and ridiculed and spends four years of her life being overlooked and mistreated and misunderstood. That's what faith is. Sometimes faith is a marriage that has been wrecked by infidelity and yet God through his grace and mercy begins to heal and restore and redeem and make them whole again. That's what faith looks like. Sometimes faith is a wife who finds herself in a place that she never thought she would be. A single mom just 
trying to make it through the day. That's faith too. There are going to be times in this life when you find yourself in both groups. There were others. Faith is confidence though in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Kyle Eidelman says it this way. He writes, my faith is in God and I believe. I have faith in God's mercy that it will rain down and one day the lonely and the brokenhearted will experience comfort and peace and there will be no more sorrow and no more suffering and no more pain. My faith is in God. I have faith in God's power that he will one day heal and the crippled will walk and the blind will see. My faith is in God. I believe that God's grace will overcome and the guilty and the shamed and the addicted can find forgiveness and freedom and victory. My faith is in God. I have faith that God's justice will be seen and he will avenge his battered daughters and he will avenge his abused children. My faith is in God. I believe in a God who redeems, that he can put together what seems impossibly broken. My faith is in God. My faith is in God and in in his character. And what I know about God to be true is that God is a God who saves. That's who he is. And my faith is in him. Listen, I don't know where you are today. I don't know which group you find yourself in. I do know that if you live long enough, you're going to have a foot in both at one time or another. Whatever situation you may be facing, it may seem desperate, it may seem hopeless. But I want you to hear me. Our faith is not in what is happening to us. It's not in the circumstances that surround us. Our faith is based on the authority and the character of God and who he is. And the centurion, he got it. My friend Jack, he got it. And Jesus was amazed. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer and Caleb is going to lead us in a time of worship. But with no one looking around this morning, I just want to let you know that I have spent much of this week praying for you. not knowing your story, not knowing what you're dealing with, but trusting and believing that God has you here this moment for a reason. So in the quietness of this moment, if if I can pray for you, would you just lift your hand? Let me know. Lord, I'm struggling. sing after I pray I just want to let you know that our prayer team is going to be here this morning while we're singing after they're here for you today they want to pray with you they want to help you walk this journey I'll be here if you need me to be and if that's too awkward for you We don't really do altar calls in this church often, but listen, this altar is open. You can just.
just come and pray? You just come and lay it down, give it to God, rest in, trust in the authority that he is who he says that he is. He's a God who saves and your faith is in him. Whatever it is today, right in your seat, you're in front. Let me pray. I'm going to say, Father, I want to be able to live my life in such a way and with such a faith that it takes your breath away. Would you help us to get it, Lord? Would you help us to know that our faith is not based on what is happening around us or what is happening to us? It's not based in the circumstances of this life at all. It's based on who you are, your character, your authority that you can be trusted, that you are faithful even when we're not. And the reality, Lord, is that even when we find ourselves in group two, you've not left us, you are with us, you are in us, you've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit and you are guiding us and directing us and giving us strength. And, And though the situation may seem hopeless, that it may seem desperate, you are a God who saves salvation is coming. Our faith, God, is in you, and we believe. And so this morning, Lord, we humbly ask for you to do what only you can do, and we'll be good with that. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray all of these things. Stand together. As Donnie said, if you need prayer, we're going to have our prayer team come forward. Let's rest and reflect in the faithfulness of God.
chapter that we call the the hall of faith all, all these incredible stories of group a and group b by saying therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses men like moses noah and abraham and david and enoch women like rahab he said, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its sin and its shame. And he says, let us consider him who faced such opposition from sinful men that we don't grow weary and lose heart. As Donnie mentioned earlier, I know our prayer for you today is that what you experienced and what you heard will help you to fix your eyes or perhaps fix your eyes again on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you for gathering with us today. You can, be, you can uh, remain standing for just a second. I'm going to give you a heads up on a couple of things before uh, you leave um, today. As you are um, more than aware, this week, Governor Abbott relaxed the, uh, um, the uh, mask mandate for the state of Texas, pushed that decision back to uh, local businesses and uh, organizations. As you can imagine, we immediately started fielding several phone calls in regards to, hey, what are we going to do as a church? Do, are we still going to are we still going to uh, wear masks? So let me tell you a couple of things that we decided to do um, as a church. Um, one is we decided to dissolve our uh, Sunday morning registration for uh, attendance in regards to our auditorium space. Um, you no longer have to do that. We do ask that you would continue to sign your children up so that we can uh, make sure that our kids area is adequately staffed for that. But in conjunction with opening our doors to more people after talking to doctors inside and outside of our church, we think the safest way to do that, for the weeks ahead anyway, is uh, to continue with our current mask protocol, at least through Easter Sunday. After Easter Sunday, we're going to reevaluate this uh, once again and think through the best way forward um, after that. Now, hear me out on this. Look, I, I live in the real world just like you, and I am uh, more than aware that this conversation outside of our church walls, it's entrenched in politics. So, so please hear me when I tell you that uh, this decision has nothing to do with politics, the left or the right, Democrat or Republican. This is us um, trying to hold ourselves accountable to something that we set in, in place at the very beginning of COVID season, and that is we wanted to lead like Jesus and lead with love um, to our neighbors around us and to the community around us. We wanted to do that um, even when that requires sacrifice, uh, perhaps especially when that requires sacrifice. So after um, we dismiss in just a minute, I'm going to be right here in the front. And if you have some questions about that that you think maybe I could offer some clarity to, I'd be glad to have that conversation with you and try to share um, as much information uh, as I can. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and your grace uh, with us through this entire process. I hope you have an incredible spring break week. Don't forget to set those clocks forward next Sunday, and we'll see you next Sunday right here at Alamo Community Church. God bless you. Julie.